Hello everyone, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're going to be playing Cold Waters, the newest game out by Killerfish Games, and a third-person uh, view submarine combat game. Um, this game is the spiritual successor to Red Storm Rising of the 1980s, I believe it was, uh, which was based off of the, loosely based off of the book, Red Storm Rising by Tom Clancy. In this video, we're going to be starting a new series, uh, which looks at a, uh, a new campaign, if you will, uh, with the Captain Jack Ryan Jr., uh, a homage to the Tom Clancy uh, Red Storm Rising, which really is the impetus for this game, uh, but also a character in the newer Tom Clancy novels. And yes, I know Jack Ryan wasn't in Red Storm Rising itself, but he was in almost every other Tom Clancy book, uh, fiction book that he wrote, so that's why we're... Uh, we're including his, his son in this game. Now, in our previous videos, we've looked at the game kind of from a, a loose uh, sort of just li live stream perspective. So the, the, video pl the gameplay taken in this video is from uh, a live stream that I conducted. But the, the commentary in this video will not be. This series is going to mix live stream commentary and, um, you know, just off-the-cuff commentary. Uh, together to, to form sort of a blend of a series. Uh, but this series is going to start introducing me uh, talking about other things than just the game. Um, I know there's been a, a very warm reception around the game, around the uh, the live streams I've been doing. I've been seeing huge uh, viewership in all of this. But I'd like to have a chance to have a little bit more polish in some of this as well, uh, to have some pre, you know, pre-planned discussions. And we'll use the footage because I'm still going to continue streaming this pretty much every night, at least you know for the next couple of days anyway. Um, so that's not going to change. But if you miss the streams, the, the gameplay will be available. It's just in some cases the live stream will be uh, separate from the actual uh, commentary that shows up in the, um, you know, the, the videos that show up. So I'm going to start cutting these down to around 30 minutes, and I'm going to start talking about uh, various topics. The topic in this video I wanted to talk about is, uh, spoiler alert, the Russian Foxtrot class submarine. The Foxtrot class in Cold Waters is a submarine class that you often see in the Spetsnets uh, missions. What I mean by that is there are missions, and we're about to embark upon one, in which the Soviet Union dispatches submarines carrying uh, Russian Special Forces operators, uh, which are coming to a NATO base near you uh, to drop their, their Spetsnets soldiers off and you know have them go wreak havoc on NATO installations. Again, this video is a video that's going to look at uh, one of those missions. But it seems to me that in cold waters, almost every single Spetsnets insertion involves a Russian Foxtrot submarine. That may just be how the game is coded. I'm not sure. You know, this mission equals this submarine as the, the special forces carrier. And that's what it seems to be for the, the game Cold Waters. If you have a mission that includes enemies and dropping intelligence forces behind enemy lines, then it seems to be the case that you will always run into a Foxtrot class submarine as the Special Forces Carrier, as well as usually an escort, although not always. Uh, the escorts vary a bit. I've seen Alphas, I've seen uh, uh, Victors, uh, I've seen, I think Romeo was an escort once, but um, the escorts seem to be a little bit more random, but the actual Special Forces Operator always seems to be a Foxtrot. Enough on that point. So with the understanding that this mission is going to be, and we've already seen the mission briefing on here, and we've already got this little red uh, Russian submarine icon moving uh, although I don't think, yeah. So we've got the we've got a couple of Russian submarines moving on map, and and we are going to go ahead and engage uh, what we believe to be the the Soviet uh, special forces carrying submarine here very shortly. As we see a bunch of different uh, submarines on map, and now we're going to go uh, attempt to race and engage one. The the question comes naturally: What about the Foxtrot? What what was the Foxtrot submarine? Uh, why uh, was it? important in this era, and uh, what do we need to know about it from, from a gameplay perspective? Because uh, if this is a sub we're going to see in every one of these missions, it probably behooves us to understand a little bit uh, about the submarine itself. So without further ado, as we look at engaging this enemy submarine at around 15,000 yards, uh, the Foxtrot submarine, what was it? First off, the Foxtrot class in the game Cold Waters. Uh, we'll go over its statistics. It is a uh, ship that is an 89 foot length, a seven and a half foot beam, 
Uh, it's 2,500 tons, which is probably the first piece of information you really care about, because when you sink it, you get 2,500 tons of uh, credit to your name in terms of your, your total success as a captain. Uh, it has a crew of 75, which I think it's interesting the game includes this, but it, I don't understand how it matters uh, from a gameplay perspective. Uh, it has a range of 20,000, which again, I don't know exactly what that means. Um, here are some statistics which matter to you. Surface speed of 16 knots, I've never seen it on the surface. Submerged speed of 15 knots, I've never seen it moving more than 10, but it claims to be able to make uh, 15 knots. Um, it is a diesel electric sub, so if it was to be moving at 15 knots, it would you would assume it would require the recharging of batteries, although I'm, I'm curious how diesels are handled in-game, because diesel electric submarines in real life had very strict uh, parameters around how long they could remain submerged, at what speeds they could remain submerged, if they needed to surface to use their snorkel, if they needed to run on the surface altogether. There were a whole lot of elements to the way you had to tactically use diesel electric submarines, which I don't know if a game like this really captures because of the way the game works, right? You go on the strategic map, you move across the map, you collide with an enemy unit, you go into a battle. So presumably you're never going to see a need to actually, uh, you know, recharge your batteries or anything like that, whereas the game, uh, you know, may have the fact that it's a diesel sub, obviously, somewhere in here, uh, but it doesn't really ever need it. Uh, the submarine has six torpedo tubes all on the front. This is where it differs a bit from history, because historically the uh, Foxtrot class had ten torpedo tubes, six in the front, four in the rear, so six forward, four aft. Um, so it could fire torpedoes behind it, which is very much a World War II thing, right? If you think about the World War II German U-boats, the Type 7 U-boat, for example, I believe it had four torpedo tubes in the front and one in the back, uh, basically shot out the back between the propellers. Um, you don't see that happen as much today, and you also don't see that in the game, which is interesting. I mean, I don't know how much effort it would be for the developers to include those those stern torpedoes. I don't know if it would really make a, an impact on the gameplay. You know, those stern torpedo tubes uh, were largely uh, considered... Uh, ineffective, I believe, by the Germans. You know, their later war designs, especially the Type 21, didn't include rear-firing torpedo tubes. Um, I don't think it was something that was used all that, you know, all that often. I suppose if an enemy destroyer was chasing you and you were crazy enough to be at periscope depth, maybe you'd fire one back at them to kind of get them to dodge and give you a little bit of time, but you don't really get into stern chases in a submerged submarine. Maybe on the surface it would matter more, but I'm not, you know, it, it's, a, it's a design that you don't really see carried forward, to my knowledge, in most modern submarines. The Americans certainly abandoned it quick after, uh, you know, into, into the war. Um, but, um, you know, at least the, the Foxtrot class did have four stern-firing torpedoes. Uh, the submarine carries up to 22 torpedoes, so good luck if you're going to try and uh, get it to run out of torpedoes in, in cold waters. You'll have a lot of either dodging or sitting silent to do. Um, and that is in line with, with what the submarine had historically. Uh, the submarine also has 20 noisemakers, according to the game documentation. Uh, so, you know, if you're shooting at it, it can drop up to 20 noisemakers. I believe it's a 20-second reload. Uh, its torpedo tubes take two minutes to reload, and uh, it has a crush depth of 920 feet, or a test depth of 920 feet. Now, recognize 920 feet is not uh, uniform. It's not guaranteed. So ships regularly go below their test depth. I believe there's a there's an algorithm in the game. It's something like for every uh, you have a you have a percentage chance of crushing anywhere between like 1.25 times and 1.7. It's somewhere in that range. Uh, of your crush depth. So you can go pretty substantially below your crush depth, uh, but if you start to lose hull integrity, so if your hull strength starts to decrease down from 100% to 90%, to 80%, etc., the weaker your hull is, the less your ability to be below crush depth uh, before the ship will implode on itself. I had that happen to me once. Um, additionally, I believe if you're actually above crush depth but your hull is really weak, it's still possible for your, your hull to collapse as well. Um, the Foxtrot class, again, we regularly see it in these missions, uh, where we're, we're fighting against enemy special force insertions, and I'm not quite sure why. Um, the, the ship itself was designed in the mid-1950s, 
and it was called the Project 641 uh, class uh, diesel electric submarine. The first of the Foxtrot classes was laid down in October of 1957. Uh, it was completed in late 1958. Uh, the Foxtrot was one of the most uh, prolific of uh, diesel electric submarine classes during the war. And by the way, as we see this torpedo coming in, um, the uh, ship that we're currently fighting is a, is a Russian Victor. It's not a Foxtrot. We'll see a Foxtrot later in this particular battle. Uh, but just be aware that, you know, most of the enemy submarine shots we've seen so far are not the Foxtrot. I'll let you know when we see that. Uh, the class was built continuously uh, from the 1950s all the way to the 1980s. More than 50 were made. Actually, the Soviets took in hand 58, I believe it was. However, they made some 17 for export as well. So there were 75 boats made in total. That made it the, I believe, second or third most prolific uh, diesel-electric submarine, or actually any submarine class, uh, during the Cold War, only the uh, the Whiskey and the Romeo programs uh, produced more. Um, the the Foxtrot had some interesting history around the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, but before we get into that, I think it's interesting, when you look at the Soviet Union, they continued to build diesel boats even to the present day, whereas the United States, by the time the Foxtrot came out, as the Foxtrot was being designed, the United States was making a strategic decision to cease production of diesel-electric submarines. There was one more class that would be made after the first Foxtrot was laid down. It was already under design. I think it was called like the Barbel class. They made three of them. They were made in tandem with U.S. Skipjack class nuclear attack subs. Uh, but the American Navy basically made the decision that in order to maintain its ability to deploy submarines throughout the globe rapidly, and be able to, you know, operate independently, they were only going to field nuclear fast attack submarines. The British Navy would make that a similar decision later in the Cold War. Uh, the French Navy would also make a decision uh, along those lines later, although the French still make quite a few diesel electric subs for export. Um, there are only a handful of countries which operate nuclear attack submarines, which also operate uh, diesel electric subs. Uh, the majority of countries, if you have nuke boats, that's what you operate. If you have diesel boats, that's what you operate. Russia and China are the two most principal that still do it today. The Foxtrot was sort of this idea of a mobile minefield. It, it was a diesel-electric boat, but it could remain submerged up to about eight days. Uh, it had an endurance of about 90 days, so you could be you could set to sea and stay at sea for three months, as opposed to nuke boats, which you know could stay at sea for much longer, uh, basically as long as their, their food supplies held out. Um, the Foxtrot was a, a interesting design because it was built in the late 50s by the time which, you know, most of the Western boats had started adopting that teardrop form hull, that sort of rounded front hull. Uh, a, a, uh, you'll see it on my boat here in this uh, when, we, when we take a look at it in a second. You'll see it on the, on the Russian boat as well, the Victor, although I guess we already sunk that. Um, but the teardrop hull allows submarines to have much faster submerged performances because of the way that the water moves around it, and it was a design that, that came about after extensive wind tunnel and other testing had occurred. Uh, but the Foxtrot still used sort of the, the traditional ship-looking hull with kind of like a triangle almost on the front, uh, which pr provided greater uh, performance on the surface. But of course, submarines in, in the day and age where you know, you've got missile-armed ships with radar don't do so well on the surface. So the Foxtrot was one of the last uh, ships to be designed with uh, the non-teardrop form hull. The Foxtrot played an important role in the Cuban Missile Crisis. There were four Foxtrots, actually six Foxtrots were deployed to Cuba during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Two broke down as a result of some mechanical issues and they were with, recalled and went back to the United, or went back to the USSR. Four made it to the region. This was part of uh, the Soviet Union's attempt to bolster uh, the uh, the Cuban uh, revolution, as it will, as you can see here, me being stupid and breaching, uh, going above water. Um, but they all carried one nuclear-armed torpedo as well, and they were acting as escorts for some of these Russian supply com or supply ships that were coming in with nuclear weapons. So, brief history for those of you who don't know, in October of 1962, uh, the Soviet Union deployed medium and intermediate range ballistic missiles to Cuba, armed with nuclear weapons. The U.S. discovered them with spy planes flying over Cuba, doing reconnaissance missions, and, um, you know, as a result, 
the United States government issued a blockade against Cuba. They called it a um, a, a quarantine, I believe it was, but in in fact, it was a blockade. Uh, the Russians had some ships that were on the way carrying more weapons and material to Cuba, and the United States basically said, we're going to turn back anything that comes until these weapons are removed. Now, the Soviets were debating whether to call the bluff of, of the United States, but in, in tandem with these, in these ships, these cargo ships that were on the way, some of these uh, Foxtrot-class uh, submarines uh, were, in fact, uh, with these ships, except they were submerged, they were you know, positioned between the ships, they were strategically escorting these ships, but underwater rather than above the surface. And that made it problematic if issues ever came to a head and there was going to be a confrontation, because the United States could just as easily board or attempt to board and try and turn back surface ships, but a submarine's a little bit of a different matter. Furthermore, the submarines had taken some action to, to position themselves between uh, the merchant ships and the U.S. fleet. So the question is, if the fleet attempted to board these ships, would the submarines fire on them? And there's the added aspect of the submarines having nuclear-armed torpedoes, which the United States was unaware of at the time, and probably played a role in the U.S.'s very aggressive actions to try and turn those submarines back, get them to surface, you know, allow the U.S. to identify them, get a little bit of intelligence against them. The United States actually dropped fake depth charges on these boats in an attempt to force them to surface. They would harry them and hit them with active sonar, basically pinging the ships constantly um, and, and not allowing the ships to attempt to escape or not. Well, they, they could attempt to escape, but they wouldn't allow the ships, you know, any sort of res, respite. Uh, and in, in the end, I believe three or four of the submarines ended up surfacing and, uh, you know, in, in visual sight of, of U.S. vessels. Um, again, the U.S. did not know that these ships had nuclear-armed torpedoes. There's been some debate on how much risk there really was. One of the captains or one of the crew members claiming, you know, if the U.S. had attempted to uh, to board the merchants, he would have fired it on them. Uh, you know, other captains claiming that no way in hell would they have launched their nuclear torpedoes. In fact, that they had orders expressly prohibiting them to launch their, their nuclear torpedoes without express permission uh, from, you know, from Moscow, even if, uh, you know, they were being attacked, they wouldn't have had the authorization to use these torpedoes. It's also interesting that the, the Foxtrot class was uh, used, or was, um, you know, the Foxtrot class was, uh, I can't even think right now, the Foxtrot class was considered uh, for the transport of the, the nuclear weapons uh, to Cuba in the first place. So when the Soviet Union was deciding, hey, let's bring these weapons to Cuba, the thought was originally, let's put the nuclear weapons on board these Foxtrot submarines and just ship them across the ocean that way. That way they can be covert. Uh, in the end, the decision was to put them on merchant ships because uh, there was concerns around the ability to shield the crew from the radiation from the, the weapons warheads. Uh, but it would have been an interesting idea is transporting these weapons by submarine rather than merchant ships. One uh, might might think about how the Cuban Missile Crisis may have played out differently if, in fact, the U.S. Navy had no warships to board, had no warships to turn back. They're not warships, but no merchant ships to turn back. You know, the entire, the entire embargo may have been far less effective uh, if submarines would have had to be fired on to actually turn them back. Because while the U.S. could harry uh, submarines that were coming in and out of Cuba, Without actually shooting them, it would have been very difficult to stop. You know, you go in their way, you can't exactly board them, they'll just dive, um, and other things like that. Do you risk ramming the snorkel of the submarine to try and keep it below surface? I mean, that things start to get pretty uh, dicey pretty quickly if that's the approach you're going to take. Uh, and thus, the Foxtrot played an important role in history, but again, it also played an important role because of its large uh, number of units built. Uh, 58 in the Soviet Union, 17 to export. A bunch of those went to Cuba. I believe eight or so of them went to India. Uh, there were various modifications made of the submarines to make them more relevant and more, um, you know, modern. Although one might say that they weren't all that modern to begin with, again, because of the lack of the teardrop hull, because of the advent of nuclear power in the U.S. going with an all-nuclear navy, or at least an all-nuclear submarine force, uh, the Foxtrot's utility was, was not quite as clear. Now, when it came to the Foxtrot's use in the Soviet viewpoint, the American viewpoint was we've got to send submarines all over the world, we've got to send them quickly, uh, we can't afford to have a bifurcated navy with some of our resources going to, to nuke boats and some going to diesels uh, that are far less, in our opinion, that are far less effective. So the question remains, how would the Soviets use them? 
Well, the answer is, uh, quite effectively, I within their own way. So the United States Navy, keep in mind, it was building nuclear attack submarines, but it also had to build a large surface fleet. The U.S. Navy was heavily invested in aircraft carriers and a large surface navy. The Soviet Union wasn't until the 1970s. Uh, from 1945 till 1970-ish, roughly, uh, the Soviet Navy was largely avoiding uh, large surface vessels. I should really say from the mid-50s, because Stalin did have some pet projects and some large surface combatants that he was attempting to build, uh, and a lot of that got scrapped on his death. So really from the mid-50s to the 70s, uh, the Soviet Union focused heavily on submarines instead. So the Soviets built nuclear boats, they built nuclear missile boats, they built diesel boats, and they had multiple tiers within there. So the, within the, the diesel boats, right after World War II, there were the, the coastal patrol, the mid-range patrol, and the long-range patrol subs. So the coastal patrols would protect in close to the Soviet Union, coastal waters, deny them access to the enemy. The mid-range boats would go out a little bit further, maybe into the Baltic, maybe into the, the near North Atlantic, and they would operate... In close, but but at medium ranges against aggressive, you know, enemy forces, and then the long range boats, which would go all the way out into you know the the mid Atlantic, into toward the U.S. coast, toward Cuba, and and operate much further from 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 shore. The reason the Soviets did this is because the bulk of their naval effort was focused on the submarine plan. So they had to figure out how are we going to combat a large American fleet that is you know large a large surface fleet with a submarine component to it. And their thought process was they can use these foxtrots, and I'm going to focus my example on the foxtrot. We can use these foxtrots as a mobile minefield, uh, which basically means if it moves really slow and it's below the water, it can be a quiet boat. So we can use this as essentially an area denial tactic, position a, a picket of these across the North Atlantic, and then the enemy has to deal with these, or they have to be denied access to a region. Um, the nuke boat's job was to go quickly out, act aggressively, sink other subs, in the American perspective, sink other subs, and, you know, effectively control the sea. The Foxtrot's perspective is more to deny access to the sea to, you know, U.S. forces. Um, I'll, I'll actually quote a U.S. naval officer's uh, assessment of the way the Foxtrot would be. And uh, this quote is actually from a book called Cold War Submarines, The Design and Construction of U.S. and Soviet Submarines, 1945 to 2001. It was written in 2004, I believe it was, uh, by Norman Polymer and K.J. Moore. So it's actually a pretty interesting read um, that, I, that I recently picked up as a result of Cold Waters. Uh, I'll throw a link, uh, an affiliate link, in the, in the description if you guys are interested. So far, it seems really interested. I'm, I've been mainly focusing on Soviet boats and kind of Soviet uh, tactics and, and, and understanding uh, where a lot of their, their doctrine came from, which is very different from U.S. doctrine. But in this book, uh, there's a quote uh, from a former U.S. Uh, captain, uh, Thomas A. Brooks. Uh, he was in Navy intelligence, and his remarks were toward the use of Soviet nuclear boats uh, after the U.S. had you know, more or less decided to go with nukes only. His quote was about the use of Soviet diesel boats, sorry. The Soviets, and I'll, so the quote will start, the Soviets see a continuing utility of the diesel submarine. It is excellent for confined waters, such as those in the Mediterranean. It makes a superb mobile minefield, in Soviet parlance, for purposes of forming submarine barriers. It can be more effective, and it can serve quite successfully for delousing high-value units, reconnaissance, sealing off choke points, and many traditional submarine missions where the speed and endurance of a nuclear uh, submarine are not required. The Soviets clearly have a commitment to the diesel boats forever. So again, this was the U.S. Navy recognizing that you know while the U.S. Navy had decided to move away from diesel subs, the natural geography of the Soviet Union, the bodies of water around the Soviet Union, and the really the the fact that the Soviet Union's goal would be to deny access to uh, Western Europe by the United States using their submarines. So the goal of the Soviets would be to, you know, all right, the U.S. needs to move supply convoys across the Atlantic. We can put a, a picket, a line of picket submarines out there. We can put Foxtrot subs, put them in place, and we know the enemy's going to have to cross their path. Whereas U.S. nuke boats don't know that necessarily. They can't just pick at a location because the Soviets don't have the same logistical need of crossing large bodies of forces across an ocean. They don't know the route that the enemy will take. Um, and therefore, uh, you, you know, you will have uh, a, a different 
need that the Soviets have. Additionally, the vast majority of Soviet naval funds at this time are flowing into the submarine force. So you don't need a one-purpose navy. The U.S. has to balance resources against carriers, destroyers, and submarines. The Soviets basically can pour all the resources into submarines. And so you see a more complicated and, and, uh, a, and diverse set of missions with more specific purpose-driven boats that theoretically could be better at doing that one thing they need to do than having a general purpose boat that needs to do everything. The general purpose boat lets you do everything at a lower cost, but maybe less efficiently. The Soviet thought process would be we can have a, a series of purpose-driven boats and designs that can do their specific thing much better than, you know, than a general purpose boat. The problem with that approach is in terms of the Soviet Union, their technology was lagging behind their, their commitment, their industry, their, their resources, didn't allow them to design as as high a quality a boat as they could have. But that same strategic principle uh, can be seen in other navies, in Western navies, uh, in Germany and France, where they have built very effective diesel boats, in Sweden, uh, where they've had very specific needs that in some cases are similar to what the Soviet Union had uh, during the Cold War. And it allowed them, you know, their, their ability to harness technology, industry, and whatnot, showed that those types of boats, those types of needs could be met could be done very well, and even even Russia and China today are using diesel boats in a similar fashion, and you see them being uh, very good at what they do as well. Um, you know, you, the the improved kilo class submarine is a very deadly and very quiet submarine. Um, the the Chinese and the Russians have some newer models that are coming down the pipe, which are also very you know reported supposedly very effective as well. Um, but that's enough about that. That's the Foxtrot submarine. I'm sorry I talked over the entire battle, including my sinking of the Foxtrot. Um, but uh, that, that second submarine that we did sink was indeed uh, a Foxtrot class boat. So there you have it, the Foxtrot class submarine uh, in the game and also as it was in history. Um, obviously, we're fighting with our own Narwhal class. I would have played with the Foxtrot, but at this time that I'm making this video, uh, the Soviet ships are not yet in the game, um, and I didn't want to. And frankly, I didn't have at the time I was uh, I was playing and recording this. Um, you know, I was doing a, a campaign with Jack Ryan Jr. Uh, as I said at the start of this video, so I didn't want to you know throw out the whole campaign just for a short little little fight with a Ma. I don't know. I don't know if the Foxtrot's modded yet. I've seen a few Russian subs modded in game, but I haven't seen the Foxtrot yet. So maybe it is in game as a mod, maybe it isn't, I'm not quite sure. Um, either way, guys, hope you enjoyed the video. Um, you know, we're going to see kind of a mixture of this and gameplay audio uh, mixed in. So we'll see some of these videos. We'll see some other videos as well. And there we go. That last torpedo self-destructed. No vessels, weapons, or aircraft nearby. No flooding, so we can leave combat uh, here uh, immediately. And then uh, we, can, we can get to work on, on winning the war. And there you have it, one enemy Victor, Cla Victor 1 class nuclear submarine and one Foxtrot class submarine, both sunk, the Foxtrot carrying the enemy special forces. You can see here me getting my congratulatory message from my commanding officer as a result of our success. Again, the game always has these guys in control of the, the special forces, but I can't find any history or any real call out where the Foxtrot would have in fact been used that way. I suppose it could have been, but again, the tactics that they talk about here is more as aerial denial, mobile minefield, kind of picket type ship. It really doesn't talk about special forces insertions, um, although I suppose later, especially by the 80s when the, when the Foxtrot was clearly out obsolete and outclassed, it would make sense to use these boats uh, in ulterior missions that don't involve intending anyway to fight U.S. subs. Um, certainly seems like you'd be putting your special forces at great risk though if you're giving them a crappy boat to get in, in, in and out. Anyway, guys, that's going to do it for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed the discussion around the Foxtrot class. Uh, let me know your thoughts below. If this is something you want to see more of, I, I certainly, that's my intent, uh, is to chop up some of these pre-streamed, uh, you know, sessions into something that might be a little bit more enjoyable. Uh, but, you know, again, if that's something that you're okay with a little bit of a mix and match between, all right, here's some stream audio and here's some other discussions, let me know. Otherwise, guys, until next time, this is The Historical Gamer saying thank you, as always, for tuning in. Uh, sorry there wasn't a stream yesterday. Uh, I had planned a stream. I actually took a nap and slept way later than I intended to and just kind of slept through the rest of the night. So uh, there will be a stream again tonight, 10 o'clock Central Standard Time. Uh, well, actually, we'll say 10.30 Central Standard Time. 
uh, today. Uh, that is June 13th. Uh, so uh, tune in if you'd like to, to pick up. Uh, we're a little bit further ahead of, of where we are in this, in this video here. But again, guys, uh, until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching, and I'll check you guys on the stream. All right, I'm out.